Hey folks, Jeff from Corrugated Cavalier here. Today we have the topic of mail. A lot of people will probably know it as chain mail. Um, I am going to stick to a fairly narrow time period of about 1350 to 1400. Um, so the second half of the 14th century because it is such a big topic and because I am portraying a knight or a man at arms in roughly 1380 to 1390 is what I shoot for, so it's, um, you know, more relevant to what I'm portraying. This is the next installment in kind of my series about the arms and armor of a man at arms in the 1380s to 1390s. You can find the video about the Lindenier and arming garments up there in the cards. So this is our next installment. We'll be moving into some plate body and limb coverings next. So what we are going to start with is just some of the common types of mail that folks were wearing at this time. And for that, I'm mostly going to be referring to the Tower Armory in the 14th century by Tom Richardson. It's a fantastic book. I've used it a lot, as you can tell by the beat up cover. Um, so this is an account from England, but it's one of the most detailed that we have. And, you know, it's likely that other places were at least using similar mail items as well at the time. So I'm mostly going to use that. Uh, so let's just get right into it. What were some of the common types of mail items that they were wearing? So first of all, one thing that we pretty much all know are uh, shirts or haubergeons. So this is a covering that covers the torso, probably the upper legs to some extent, and the arms as well. Um, could be long sleeved, could be short sleeved, etc. There are quite a few of these in the account uh, dating into the 1350s, 1360s, and beyond, but we also start to get the appearance of male sleeves. A male sleeve is exactly as it sounds, a sleeve made out of mail and um, part of the body as well. Now, a lot of people think that this is like purely a 15th century and later thing, but the Tower Armory accounts uh, suggest otherwise. They appear pretty early, at least by the 1350s, if not earlier, I'd have to check on that, but definitely by the 1350s, you have male sleeves appearing. Now, why would you want a male sleeve? Um, well, the most logical and obvious answer, in my opinion, and what most people go with, is to save weight. Because at this point, we have pretty well developed plate torso protection. I'm not gonna do up the whole thing, unfortunately, for you, but we have more developed torso protection, plate torso protection. This is a Corzina based off of a Manuscript image from 1370 to 1380. Um, so you can see that there's like a big plate for the chest, the heart area here. Some bigger plates around that as well. But once you get into the abdomen and skirt groin kind of area, it's made up of a lot of smaller plates. And they're all overlapping for the defense. But anyhow, when I put this on, you can see I could make the decision to say, well, I don't necessarily need mail under this as well. Some people still did, uh, of course. Some people did wear full shirts under this, but I could have just a sleeve instead. So when I have my male torso protection on, I can just have the sleeve and not worry about what's underneath here as much to save some weight. Um, that is probably the most likely explanation. So there are quite a few sleeves in the account from 1350 and 1360 as well. And even by 1360, uh, 1360s, I don't remember exactly which year, uh, the amount of sleeves, the pairs of sleeves that they have, outpaces the amount of shirts in the inventory in the tower armory as well. Um, so yes, lots of male sleeves, still lots of male shirts as well though. The next, one of the most next common items is skirts or ponces. And skirts were often mentioned as a pairing with sleeves. So a male skirt will protect 
sort of the groin and upper legs area. And mine I hang roughly around here. Um, so my skirt doesn't have any like tight to the body protection, but it sounds like that's what a ponce is. Um, there's also something called a brayette, which is kind of like male boxer shorts almost. And uh, Tom Richardson says it sounds like a ponce is probably a skirt with uh, some kind of connecting thing to go between the legs, sort of like a brayette and skirt combination. But some sort of lower body groin protection um, and it's often paired with sleeves to kind of be similar to a shirt or hauberk or haubergeon and still like that weight savings idea but still some male protection. Um, the next really common item would be an aventail. So these are paired with bassinets typically and this is basically throat defense, so it would overlap the cord Xena if I had it on. Once again, it's hard to have everything on at once, but you can see, if you can imagine if I had it on, that if I had it on, this would be overlapping the edge of the cord Xena and provide throat defense if something came in here to try to kill me. So those are aventails, very common at the time as well. And related to aventails, sort of a secondary line of throat defense would be collars or pizans. And collars uh, are um, usually densely woven either by very small rings or I think we have one or two examples of a six in one weave instead of a four in one weave to protect the throat. And uh, a lot of people uh, think of Pizan as more of like a big bishop's mantle or cape that has mail coming, hanging all the way down here as well, connected to a collar. Um, Tom Richardson doesn't believe that that's how it's used in the Tower Armory accounts and that it's more just like some hanging over onto the chest and shoulders and possibly with a Latin or brass border. And he surmises that this may have potentially have been worn over the plate if it had a Latin border, otherwise it wouldn't show. It's hard to say, but either way, it's another form of male protection for the throat. So if you have the aventail and a collar or pizan underneath, then you have sort of two layers, just in case it sneaks under the aventail. Um, there are a few pairs of chosses still in the inventory in the 1350s, which is just like male leg coverings, basically. Some male hose, almost. And there are also gussets mentioned. And um, the way that we typically think of gussets would be uh, male sewn into the arming garment in certain vulnerable areas, like the elbow or the armpits. It's hard to say exactly, the account doesn't describe it, but it seems likely that it's at least something similar to that later usage of the term gusset as well. So this would be to have even more weight savings. So if you had plate upper arms and plate lower arms that had pretty good coverage, then, and uh, shoulder pauldrons or spalders or something else, then you may not even want all the weight of sleeves. Maybe you just sew gussets into the elbows and the armpits. Hard to say, but it's likely something like that. Um, there are also a couple of items of interest in this account, just to mention for fun, there's something called Jazzerant mail, which is mail sewn between two layers of textiles. So there are no surviving examples from Europe. Uh, as you can imagine, that would be hard to preserve because you can't maintain the mail when it's sewn between two layers of textiles. There are surviving examples from other parts of the world. There's also one Latin shirt mentioned in this account, which would mean some kind of copper alloy ring or so like brass or something like that entirely entire shirt made of latin or brass rings there's also something there's some discussion around what italians may have done at this time um, some people think that italians wore full shirts predominantly um, for the reason that they were mostly cavalry fighters at the time and the weight savings were not as important because they were sitting on top of a horse um, it seems logical, I just haven't seen any real evidence for that, it's just something that I hear people talking about. So um, if anybody has actual evidence of that being uh, done, or that being predominant, shirts being predominant for Italians, whereas other people may have been 
opting for sleeves and stuff like that, please let me know. Um, it still seems likely to me that some Italian men at arms and knights would opt for the sleeve and skirt combination. I don't think it would be a foreign concept to them. Let's move on to some of the finer details of what the male was like. Um, at this time, the cross section of the rings was predominantly flat in surviving examples. So what I mean by that is you can see, this is a very small ring, so it's it's hard to see, I understand. But you can see that this is like a flat cross section ring. It's the ring is not round in shape like a round wire or something like that. It's pounded flat. Um, there's some discussion about the reasons for this. I'm not going to go into that really here. Um, but later on, as you move, I believe, into the late 15th and 16th centuries, especially in Germany and some other places, you start seeing round rings more, but there is no clear-cut kind of rule here by any means. Um, but in the late 14th century, what I'm talking about right now, you can only see these kind of flat cross-section rings um, in extant examples. Another topic is um, whether it's half riveted or fully riveted. So half riveted would mean that some of the rings, half of the rings roughly, are stamped circles out of metal. You can see the lower, the bottom edge of this aventail are not riveted. They are stamped circles out of metal. But then you can see the row above that is is all riveted. I don't know how easy that is to see on camera, but the row above the bottom row is all riveted. The bottom row is just stamped out of metal. It doesn't have to be that configuration, but you get the point. Half of the rings are riveted, half or not. This would make it uh, presumably less labor intensive to manufacture. Now, uh, usually people think of about 1400 as the date where we start seeing fully riveted mail, but the Tower Armories uh, seems to suggest that it starts appearing as early as 1340, potentially even earlier. So that means, so fully riveted means every single link is riveted. So this is some mail that I've worked on and you can see that every single ring in there is riveted. Okay. Every single ring in there is riveted. So why would you want to do this if that was more labor intensive? Um, you know, some people have conjectured that it could be kind of a status thing or something like that. Um, I'm not so sure. Like, mail was not particularly visible. They were even covering it up even more. Um, I don't, I'm not so convinced by that argument. I actually think it was a practical reason. Um, in my tests, trying to stab it with a dagger, is the rivet a weak point? I mean, kind of, but what happens when a rivet pops is a lot of times it still maintains integrity. Because of the other rings around it kind of holding it in place, that rivet doesn't usually come completely out. So it still maintains its shape. However, if you bust through or cut through a ring, which can happen, I did do that with the dagger almost as often as I did popping a rivet, then that's much easier. It doesn't have anything holding it together at that point to twist and uh, not have structural integrity anymore. So I personally, I think that it's for a practical reason. Also, um, I don't know if they would do this for sure or not. If it was damaged, they might not want to do it. But if you pop a rivet, you can just replace the rivet instead of replacing an entire ring as well. These are just theories and conjecture, but um, I, I don't feel like people would make um, fully riveted mail just for a status symbol. They have much better ways of doing things to show their status than having fully riveted mail. In my opinion, I could be wrong. So speaking of rivets, there are usually two types that we talk about, and that's round or dome riveted, which is what I showed you here, and wedge riveted. Um, this is also another thing in mail where there's no hard and fast rule of when they switched over to wedge riveted from round riveted. Um, I believe we start seeing some examples in the 12th and 13th centuries of wedge riveted, but uh, in, Isaac's, in Isaac Krogh's paper, which I'll reference a little bit more at the end, uh, we also see 
things in the items in the 15th and 16th centuries that have round rivets as well. Um, some of these seem to be recycled from earlier centuries, but like the 13th and 14th centuries, so that means that at least through there, at least sometimes uh, round rivets were, dome rivets were probably being used and potentially even later at times as well. There's no, uh, as far as I understand from people I've talked to, there's no like hard and fast rule about that, but wedge rivets become more predominant definitely into the 14th centuries and later. Um, okay, nerding out about rivets, great. Um, so let's talk about the tailoring of male garments a little bit as well. I'm mostly going to be talking about sleeves here. And uh, Isaac Croak has this really awesome paper, um, Male Tailoring in Late Medieval Renaissance in Germany, a study of the male garments in Vesta Coburg. Um, and he actually had the items in hand. He's a fantastic male tailor. And uh, he marked where they were doing modifications in the pattern of weaving for tailoring. So um, I'm going to insert some pictures here. I hope that Isaac Krogh is okay with this. You can find his paper uh, for free um, and download it. So I, I hope it's not a problem. If it is, somebody please let me know. But I, I'm giving Isaac credit either way. But I can reshoot this if that's a problem. Anyways, um, I'm going to take out my sleeves here and show you uh, just kind of as, a, as an example. Um, these are not particularly tailored, but I'm going to use them as an example to show you what it might have been like. So in the armpit, instead of just this kind of T that we have here, and I do have a little space here, there, there is a bit of a pocket. Um, I don't fully understand the tailoring method, but they had a tailoring method to give some space in the armpit so when the arms raised, it wouldn't pull on the body. Um, and you can see here that that's that's not really the case. This is uh, this is Indian mail. It's I, I like it quite a bit actually. It's it's not perfect though, as I'm going to show with some of the tailoring, but I still quite like it. It's it's well made, other than the tailoring maybe. So the armpit would have some type of connection to give it uh, like a third dimension in the armpit. So when it raised, it didn't really pull on the body. Um, the elbow was usually tailored as well. Um, this is not a tailored example, but there were some examples that didn't have tailored elbows as well, but most did have some kind of tailoring. One of the most common ways to tailor the elbow was to kind of make a diagonal in the upper arm and then just attach the lower arm straight so it would have a natural bend in it. And uh, depending on how you tailored it, you could make this more or less extreme as well. Uh, there were also uh, contractions in the upper and lower arm to make it fit the arm more closely to save weight as well so you don't have male just kind of like drooping down and not really serving any purpose. So this is another thought about cutting weight. It could also be uh, using less materials. Hard to say exactly what their logic was, but both seem totally plausible to me. Um, there's also, it sounds like, I don't have a great answer for this, but it sounds like there is a variety of ways to finish the cuff of the wrist as well. Um, if you're interested in this kind of thing, I really recommend going and downloading Isaac Croak's paper on that. So just to sum up um, what men, men at arms and knights were wearing commonly, there are probably other examples in this period. Um, male shirts and hauberks, male sleeves and skirts, which I said were usually paired together. Um, male aventails, collars of mail. Um, there may have been some gussets and other things like that as well, but those were the common items. Um, most of the, if not all, of the examples we have from this period are flat cross-section rings. Uh, wedge rivets are becoming more predominant at this time. Hard to say exactly. Uh, we still see round rivets. They recycled a lot of material because mail is hard to, is very labor intensive to make. And uh, lastly, that especially sleeves and hauberks were tailored to fit, not only fit, but also allow uh, unhindered movement as well. Um, I hope that this was enlightening to some folks. It's, some of this you may already know. Hopefully I, I brought up some things that 
you didn't as well. If you have any corrections that you're totally sure of or you think and you may have a source for, please like comment down below. I'm, I'm not an expert on this whatsoever. I would like to shout out uh, the sources, Tom Richardson, Tower Army in the 14th Century, as I mentioned, Isaac Krogh, Male Tailoring in Late Medieval Renaissance Germany, The Study of the Male Garments in Vesta Coburg, and uh, a couple of folks from my Discord. If you would like to join my Discord, get a hold of me on Twitter, or uh, I'm on TikTok as well. Uh, or if you know some other way to get a hold of me, that's fine too. I'm not going to put it here on the channel, though. Um, we talk about HEMA and arms and armor and that kind of thing. Um, Arm the Armor, who has a great Twitter. He posts lot, lots of beautiful stuff, a very knowledgeable guy. Also does some uh, male creation and tailoring. Uh, I'll put his Twitter below. And uh, Karadoc, who has a Discord server all about mail. And uh, if you want a link to that, I'm sure I can get you in touch with Karadoc or get you a link somehow. That, that server is great as well. Um, so shout out to both those guys. Uh, there's some pretty good discussion that goes on in my Discord, even though it's pretty small at the moment. If you would like, just get a hold of me and I can get you a link. All right. Long video. Next up in this series is plate, torso, and limb protection, and I hope to see you guys around for that. Once again, put any questions or comments down below. I'd love to get a conversation started. I love mail. I love the late 14th century and stuff like that. So conversations are great. Thank you all for watching and coming by the channel. Click like, subscribe, share around to people who might find this interesting. Be good to each other, and ciao.